Uh, I was uh, sorting out this lighting without moving shit around, but hey, welcome back to story time with me for possibly only the second time. Join me for a drink here while I do this. Um, yeah, I guess the first thing I've got to say is this episode or whatever the fuck it is, this chapter, this video is absolutely dedicated to the Grinmas family and anyone who's ever loved a part of them. Um, heavily, heavily on my mind right now and I'm tired of being far away. Um, that aside, because it's hard to dwell on it, I have to say this guy and anyone who needs to know what this is will know what this is. This guy has been pretty much like in my fist all fucking day. It's so fucking warm right now. Um, shit's fucked. Uh, love you all. Uh, I don't know how else to say it. I don't know how else to communicate this. Anyway. Um, so, Headhunters of the Amazon. We are right up to chapter 8. Um, chapter 8 of Phantom People and I have to apologise before I start this because this shit's kind of fucked up. I have to say some lines here that I'm going to struggle with. And this is why I, I can never refer to the author as our hero. Because of what's going to happen in this chapter. This is... I haven't read the whole book. Fuck knows what's coming next. But I've read this bit before and this bit's fucked up. Bert, you know what I'm talking about. This is my drop face. Alright. So, it's been a couple of weeks since the last one. And um, you'll remember, or maybe not, but basically they went off into the R Sentinel in the Amazon. No fuckers been. They got some fucking local indigenous cunts to fucking help them through it. Um, got to the point where they found the tracks of this completely unknown peoples. The fucking locals ditched them in the night just after they found this. They managed to lose all their shit while they were wandering by themselves. And, you know. I muttered something about having to sleep first and sank into oblivion. Jack, hero that he was, attacked that terrible fence of thorns. How he succeeded in getting through, I don't know. The next thing I knew was that he was kicking me and shouting at me. Get up for God's sake, man. I found a trail as big as Broadway. So that's where we finish our last chapter. Again, just launch it, fellas. On to chapter eight, Phantom People. Well, anyway, I hope that beggar won't be at home when we turn up. Jack pointed to an enormous footmark as he spoke. The news that he'd brought me as I lay half unconscious had had a marvellous effect on the muscles of my legs. Once more, they answered to my will, and I was on my feet in a moment, staggering after my companion to the gap in the thicket, which he'd opened with the last bit of strength that was left him. Caring nothing for the pain of our wounds, which were reopened by the cruel thorns, we had burst through into that remarkable forest highway along which we were now making. It was a clean-cut tunnel, not an inch less than five yards wide from side to side, made by those elusive men for whom we had looked so long, made with such care and on so large a scale as I've never seen before or since. It was as if a house had been dragged through the forest. The purpose of it I was never able to discover. It was unique not only by reason of its breadth but of its great length. It ran for at least a mile dead straight for the greater part of the distance. There's only one possible explanation of its existence that occurs to me, and that's that it may have been the commencement of an exceptionally large chakra. Be that as it may, the sight of it put new life into us two. We hustled along, good for another hundred miles. There must be something at the end of so large and fresh a trail. Standing out among the innumerable treks of men, women and children with which the trail was freshly marked was that giant's footprint which had called forth Jack's comment. The first thing to decide had been whether we would follow the crowd or not. 
the great majority of the tracks ran away from the river, so we resolved to try our luck in the opposite direction, as we should be completely at the mercy of the savages wherever we found them. Turning to the right, then, we made along as fast as we could, thinking only of the food and shelter we should find. After covering only about 500 yards, we saw, not far ahead, the unmistakable light of a clearing. A few more minutes, and we were out in the open, staring at rows of banana plants, yucca, yams, sweet potatoes, all that our hearts desired. The chakra covered three or four acres, and in one corner stood a house. This we found after we had followed the trail through the clearing, which was itself a miniature forest of cultivated plants. We came to a halt some ten yards from its gable end and stood gazing at what might mean for us salvation or final disaster. As we stood there, shivering in the pelting rain, we could not have looked a very formidable pair. Surely no human being would be afraid of us. So thought Jack, who proposed that we should just walk in as one of the tribe and spar them for something to eat. I, on the other hand, thought we should let out a yell, rush the place and hope for the best. Better get inside before we yell, at any rate, Jack returned, so that they can hear us. His view of the matter prevailing, I led the way across the few remaining yards to the house and pulled aside the palm leaves which covered the opening that served for a door. I entered and found myself in the dark. Jack, who was standing by close behind with his machete, carved a gap in the wall and let in some light. We were alone. The one room house The one room house was some forty feet long and half as broad. The first thing we saw was corn, the bunches of husks tied in pairs and hanging over the rafters. There were besides bunches of bananas and plantains in different stages of ripeness, and baskets of wild fruit. To give ourselves a view of the approaches to the house, we cut away each end from the level of the rafters to the ground. The house was really nothing but one big gable whose sloping roof rested on the ground at either side. Having protected ourselves against surprise, we set about making a fire. While Jack was tinkering with the savage's fire maker, I began to explore the smoke racks for meat. We were in no condition to eat green fruit. We needed hot, cooked food. Stepping in one of the fireplaces, I burned my foot. And looking among the embers, I discovered a few hot coals, which we immediately blew into a blaze. Moving the stones to the centre of the house for safety, we built up a rousing fire and were soon parching corn and roasting plantains and arrowroot, soaking up the blessed warmth the while. What a feast was that! No need for me to enlarge on what it meant to us. Looking around, we took stock of the interior. The roof was stuck full of spears, beautifully made from chanta wood, and tufted with feathers from the lumbiki, which is toucan and kachua. There were piles of round earthenware brick-red pots. Stone hatchets fitted with wooden handles lay about. Paraphernalia for making fires was stowed away in the corner. Roughly made blowguns were lying on the crossbeams. A small quantity of masata was stored in one of the pots. A dozen stone fireplaces were ranged round the sides of the dwelling, each with a shelf made of small sticks suspended from the roof immediately over it. Dishes made of gourds cut in two were scattered about. There was absolutely nothing in the way of furniture, nor were there any signs of apparatus for spinning or weaving, nor even mats on the clay floor. The place was in an orderly state, just as though the inhabitants had suddenly walked out in the middle of their everyday life. And thinking it over, we came to the conclusion that... They could not have been gone more than 48 hours before we took possession, for that was as long as the fire could have remained alive without attention. Doubtless, they'd heard our firing further down the Asuni when out hunting, and, being utterly ignorant of all that pertained to the outer world, had fled from our approach. Whether they would return or not was an open question. It seemed likely that they would return sometime, at any rate, to find out what had become of their homes. Thus, being absolutely unacquainted with the nature and habits of the savages, we naturally felt inclined to take as many precautions as we could against a possible visit from the rightful owners of the dwelling we'd usurped. So we slept with what arms we could collect at our sides, I, 
and a bed of spears laid from beam to beam six foot above ground. Jack, by the fire, with his machete and a spear in his hand. To protect myself from the keen edges of the three-cornered blades, which ran half the length of the spears, I covered them with several layers of that material, which alone makes life possible for mankind in the Amazon basin, the leaves of the ever-present palm. <coughs> Thus, we entered on a third period of our expedition. For three weeks we lived in our new home. During all that time we were never out of sight of it, and whenever we left its shelter, it was only to dig up roots from the chakra, or collect firewood. We were in a bad way. The itching sores with which we were covered nearly drove us mad once our blood began to flow again. They'd spread all over our bodies until we could scarcely bear the agony. Our feet, too, had festered with the thorns still embedded under the skin. We spent most of our time trying to dig them out with the help of the machetes, and little by little we rid ourselves of them. The separation, chig chig, as the Indians say, from which we were suffering, took a long time to loosen its hold on us. Our nails became loose, and watery matter exuded from under them, as well as from the sores with which our feet were covered, and even from between our toes. It gave off a particularly offensive odour. Time and our own devices were the only aids to a cure we had. While we could stand the pain in our feet, bad though it was, we had to find an immediate remedy for the itching of our bodies, or go crazy. It occurred to me that nothing can live beyond a certain temperature, and that the microbes in our skins could be reached by heat with comparative ease. So it was that we hit on an effective means of ridding ourselves of them. We took it in turns to operate on each other, heating banana skins in the fire and holding them on the sores long enough to raise a blister. The process was certainly painful, but we were glad enough to exchange an intolerable itch for even a burn. Of one thing we had to be careful, not to break the skin of the blister for fear of worse infection taking the place of the last. If the savages had come back during that time, they would have found one of us sitting astride the prostrate body of the other, solemnly torturing him with fire. With the amazing adaptability of the human frame, our nerves became so accustomed to the treatment that towards the end it caused us no pain. On the contrary, we became jealous of our turns. Meanwhile, our feet, with constant bathing in hot water, had taken a turn for the better, and there was nothing to do but wait in patience. We were, of course, practically naked, having used almost all the remnants of our clothes as rags. Round our necks and waists, however, still hung the bands of our cotton shirts and pants of better days, from which were draped a few soiled ribbons. Although we never saw a sign of the infielas during our whole period of convalescence, it is practically certain that their scouts were watching our movements all the time from the edge of the forest. In the light of my subsequent experience of those nameless unknown people, I am not surprised that we lived unmolested. They are, I think, as low in a scale of development as any living men. They live by the water course, but have neither canoes nor rafts, and apparently catch no fish. We never came across any trace of even the most primitive form of carpentering, except their houses, which, as I've said, were made by leaning saplings against a common ridge pole supported on two posts, and thatching the simple framework. Their houses are always built with the gables facing east and west, a matter of superstition, I imagine, for they never let any light into them. They wear no clothes, whatever, a fact which is borne out by the absence of looms from all their houses, and by the fleeting glimpses which we caught of them from time to time as they dashed through the forest at our approach. They belong to the Stone Age, being ignorant of the use of any metals, even gold, to Jack's disgust. For weapons, they have nothing but the spear and blowgun. They squat and sleep on the bare ground, even the simplest form of furniture being unknown to them. I never saw any musical instruments such as a tom-tom or reed pipe, which are known to the more advanced Kivaros. Later on, I learned something of their religion. This is the bit I struggle with. They bury their dead singly in the forests. The corpse is interred in a sitting position, as with the ancient Incas, and a miniature house is built on it. A pot of masata is set on the ground over the body. Evidently, they revere or fear the dead. One day, 
After we'd been in the country some months and built a camp by the river, I came across a grave by the side of a trail, and, out of curiosity to see at close quarters the kind of people the savages were, started to investigate. After delving a few inches, I broke through the crust of dry clay, which formed the lid, so to speak, of the hollow grave in which the body sat. Here was one of them at last, who could not run away from me. Seeing the head, I drew it from the grave to find that the long, straight black hair was still hanging from the skull. To keep it as a curio, I took it back to camp and hung it up in the house. Within 24 hours, the savages had paid a visit to the place in our absence, removed my trophy, and replaced it in the grave. That was the only time they summoned up enough courage to enter our quarters. It must have been a very strong feeling that led them to overcome their terror of us. Fucking struggle with that shit. I really struggle with that fucking paragraph. Personal adornment, a habit so common among savage people, is, as far as I could make out, unknown to them. Neither necklaces nor any other ornaments were found by us, but so much of these people in their ways was hidden from us by their refusal to have any dealings with us, that I know comparatively little about them. Most of my observations on their mode of living are necessarily mere deductions from, this, from our studies of their houses and chakras. Their aloofness was unconquerable. It would seem that they were fugitives from the world, looking upon all men as their enemies, unless they regarded us as devils, which is not unlikely. Damn, <laughs> fucking grave digging, you bastard. Doubtless, they'd been chased into the furthest depths of their forest home by their more warlike neighbours. That they are no lovers of war is certain. Had we been as highly trained in woodcraft as they, we might have caught one of them and so broken the ice. As it was, we left their country without having exchanged one single word or sign. Thus it happens that my sketch of this tribe, which, doubtless, like many another, lies buried in the unfathomless vastness of the forest which stretched from Colombia to the Argentine, is hopelessly incomplete. To return to my narrative, at the end of three weeks of vegetarian diet and careful nursing, we cured ourselves completely of the results of our five days' march. Free to turn our attention to the question of prospecting the forest for rubber, we began to explore the numerous trails which led through the high country within a few miles of our headquarters. We had been left complete masters of the whole district. Surely no invading force ever had an easier victory than had we. I do not wish to convey the idea, however, that we were pleased to be left so completely alone at a time when we were still hoping to establish friendly relations with these ghost-like men who, though everywhere, were never more than glimpsed. We were far from being convinced that we should never break down the barrier that their fear and superstition had built up between us. As if to give us an idea of what the country held in store for us, nature had planted the largest rubber tree I have ever seen on the very edge of the clearing where we lived. The rubber trees in that part of the world, the product of which is known as caoutchouc in Spanish, grow on the non-inundated lands, unlike the Taringa, which grows on the lowlands of the lower Amazon. The former grow singly, scattered through the forest, while the latter is found in groves of hundreds of trees to the acre. The caoutchouc trees are not worked by tapping, owing very largely to the great distance, which would have to be covered to collect the same amount of milk which can be drawn from a single seringa, as the groves are known locally. When a man would only have to walk, say, a couple of miles to tap a hundred seringas, he would probably have to cover a mile for every caoutchouc tree he found. And for the first time in quite a while, I don't know if it's something to do with being inebriated or what, but it looks like we're going to have to do this as a two-part section. Um, hopefully I'll post this. I don't think this was awful. We'll see. But, um, yeah, part two coming up.